Kinship is a curious thing. Its bounds may run deeper than most any others. Chroniclers more verbose than your humble servant have filled archival stacks expounding upon the virtues of loyalty to one's own blood, to kith. Yet within every family there dwell the supposed Black Ares, they who by virtue of their very selves will seemingly never fit into the molds laying down for them. The ties of family are suffocating to these individuals, yearning as they do for different lives than that those into which fate has made them players. To dance to the tune of one's own drum, it is a life quite lonely. Even those individuals who carve out for themselves a path, a domain, an existence wherein they can be satisfied well, the ties of family can remain, like tendrils of a questing, reaching flora, forever attempting to ensnare. Can one ever become truly free from the bounds of blood? This is a tale of one such individual, of when fate rested upon the shoulders of one man, of a decision that would make and break the fate of untold billions. Now then, that this is a record of the Chondax campaign. As with sadly so many tales that involve the heroes of the coming story, Chondax is not a name that has entered into the annals of history with the triumphant language of the defense of Tyros, the siege of Baal, or the battle of Pluto, nor even the solemn remembrances of the massacres at Istvan or Kalth or the in-depth analyses of tactically crucial engagements at Talarn, Beta Garmin, and Thramas. Yet without Chondax, the Imperial Endeavor would have ultimately been shattered. At Chondax, in quiet, isolated bloodshed, the future was forged. It was, by the reckoning of some chroniclers past, the first defeat of the War Master, a moment when the plans of Horus Lupercal were broken and his expectations usurped. In its telling, light may be shed upon a great many things, but, as with all matters concerning the years of the Great Heresy, many further questions are raised. A note must be made at the outset of this record. A, to one's mind, frankly wretched amount of work committed to this chronicle have been made possible by a recovered record millennia old by provenance, known as the Unbalanced Scales. As one's keener acolytes may remember, this pernicious volume is a collection of coded dispatches, picture images, auspex logs, intercepted transmissions, and even handwritten notes, all of which purport to record the 20th Legion Alpha Legion's history throughout the course of the Horus Heresy. It has been described by some of my colleagues as a cipher that sheds pure light upon the many, many secrets of the Alpha Legion. It is also highly likely that every single thing that lies within its pages is a lie. The codification and examination of the unbalanced scales was not the result of Imperial intelligence operations or even the researches of Historator's past. It came into the possession of the Terran archives in the painful years of rebuilding following the Siege of Terra. What chroniclers had survived that apocalyptic conflict were working with what resources survived to recover, preserve, and catalogue whatever knowledge managed to persist through the years of the scouring, and unto their possession, quite mysteriously, came the unbalanced scales. No records by the attending scribe adept can confirm the exact date of its entry into the archives, and only a single piece of other information regarding its arrival has ever been discovered. A handwritten note that reads simply, In the service of truth, followed by the ancient Elenki runic symbol known as Omega. Despite the deeply unsettling origin of the tome, 
The Chosen of Malkador, most notably Zarinchek Xanthus and the woman known as Moriana, who had retained significant influence over the Imperium in the years following their master's incredible act of sacrifice, claimed to be assured of its veracity, and instructed archivists to place it within the vaults for further study, if admittedly under extreme levels of security clearances and cognito hazard preparation. To further complicate matters with this already twisted set of sources, one must note that in the ensuing ten millennia of heavy-handed redactionism, intellectual devastation, and rampant puritanism, records of the mere existence of the unbalanced scales passed from imperial knowledge and scholarship. Your humble servant was only made aware of its existence when a copy of the tome arrived within my study chamber from whereabouts unknown and with additional copies of expository scholarship written in the aftermath of its cataloging, as well as an apparently fresh version of the handwritten note stating this is in the service of truth, followed by the Omega symbol. I will admit quite readily to a significant disquiet in my humors at present. The appearance of such a work, unbidden and unrequested, has happened precisely once before, in my services to committing records to these archives, and it was that corrosive piece of memetical hazard known as the Transit of the Human Soul Through Strife, or the Codex Hydra. I am choosing at this time to acknowledge the plain fact that both works deal with the supposed truths surrounding the Alpha Legion. I am also choosing not to explore the ramifications of this any further, for the sake of my own sanity. The unbalanced scales commits to record personnel files, battle honors, combat records, troop deployment, and a frankly staggering array of information besides. Thanks to it, the full involvement of the Alpha Legion in the Chondax engagement, not to mention hundreds of other conflicts besides, was finally and fully documented. Although, that is to say, presuming the contents are in fact accurate. Herein, we arrive at the Historator's Dilemma. When dealing with the 20th Legion, a collection of Astartes so profoundly renowned for their use of information itself as a weapon, skepticism of the most extreme sort is not only demanded, it is mandatory. This being said, the utter lack of sources concerning the Alpha Legion has been a problem that has dogged chroniclers for millennia. In short, one has had little choice than to believe the word of the unbalanced scales, and to attempt, where possible, to verify what is written within with other imperial sources. One must state, for the record, that a significant amount of what one has examined, and has been possible to at least tenuously verify, that which one cannot, I will admit to engaging in the fantasy that the author of the damned work somehow knew what would be verifiable and what would not, thus injecting the information that cannot be corroborated with wild unreality and toxic misinformation. Although given, given the twentieth, it is also possible that that is what they want me to believe. You may now see why your most humble servant simply disengages with these questions. They are so unanswerable, yet so compelling, that you will simply tie yourself into knots. The serpent, perhaps, devouring itself alive. The John Dax engagement originates in the immediate aftermath of the Ulanor Crusade, where the Imperium faced off against the Orcoid Empire of the war boss Urlak Urg. Considered widely, at the time, to be the last fully fundamental threat to the Imperium's existence, the destruction of this empire by the Emperor of Mankind, the Primarch Horus Lupercal, and the Legiones Astartes is a pivotal moment in history. No longer could any force within the galaxy threaten the manifest destiny of humanity as rulers of the stars. With the orcs here so defeated, there was simply no foe powerful enough left to challenge the Aquila. In the planet-spanning triumph declared by the Emperor following the victory, he proclaimed Horus Warmaster, 
to lead the great crusade in his stead, as he withdrew to Terra to continue his greatest work. Much has been made of this moment, and what it would mean for the turning of the War Master to treachery many years later. This record concerns itself with a series of orders drafted by the new War Master in the immediate days following his ascension to this new office. Whole swathes of the Imperial Army, the Armada Imperialis, the Collegia Titanica, and sundry other formations were reorganized and redeployed to undertake grand new endeavors at the War Master's behest. With dreadful retrospect, it can be discerned that clear favor was shown in these orders. Those formations that were known to hold within their hearts great loyalty to the War Master were shifted to key strategic conflict zones, while those without that loyalty were dispatched to the most occluded or bloody regions of the galaxy to continue the Great Crusade in, if not ignominy, then at the very least, obscurity. Even the War Master's Primarch brothers were not immune to these maneuvers. Those who had grudges against their father were clearly placed in opportune positions. Much has been made of it, taken as many by proof of the perfidy within Horace's heart in those early days. To one's mind, this is more proof that like kept with like. Horace's opinions of the Emperor, complicated at the best of times, were shared by many of his brothers. Even if their hearts had not turned to betrayal, grumbling does love company. This being said, however, those Primarchs who Horus would clearly consider his rivals were dispatched to distant stars. Sanguinius, beatific Primarch of the Ninth Legion Blood Angels, and supposedly one of Horus's closest brothers, was ordered to Cygnus, wherein a calamitous trap had been laid by the Architrex of Betrayal. The Lion and his Dark Angels were sent to the very edge of the galaxy itself, to purge monsters in the darkness at the edge of the Emperor's light. Rubut Gulliman, Primarch of the 13th Legion Ultramarines, was dispatched to his holds in the Galactic East, with word that another Orcoid threat was rising on the borders of the 500 worlds. In the shadows of these renowned individuals was Jagatai Khan, Primarch of the 5th Legion White Scars. Considered isolationist, and unknowable by many. The Kagan was nevertheless held in close confidence by Horus. Lupercal considered him a warrior of blunt honesty and incorruptible honor, resolute in his beliefs and uncaring for the opinions of others. This the Kagan most definitely was. His disdain for the bigotry and lack of curiosity he encountered amongst the many circles of the Imperium, and even those of his own brothers, is a fact of scholarship. He, and his legion, were frequently overlooked in imperial honor rolls and propaganda reels. This the White Scars cared little for. If anything, the open prejudices they encountered in imperial service simply showed them the true face of the empire they served, and they were content to be so-called wild men forever ranging ahead of its expanding borders, precisely because it put them so far away from that bigotry and prejudice. The Coggins' dislike for subterfuge and politicking allowed Horus to rest assured his brother held no aspirations to rival him. Indeed, though he may have ruled Chogoris, his homeworld, and his legion, the Khan could not have desired less the title of Imperator, or an empire to rule. Content was he with his station, yet loyal, too. The dedication of the White Scars to the Emperor was inviolate. Their devotion to their codes of honor, Legion and Primarch both, were legendary to those that cared to know them, and would not be forsaken with any ease. Any attempt to usurp them openly would be rebuked utterly, and attempts undertaken clandestinely would almost certainly be discovered. The insularity, both physical and cultural, of the White Scars made outside influence of their Legion a near impossibility to exert, Near impossibility, that is. This all Horus knew, and he knew his brother well, better indeed than any save perhaps Sanguinius 
and Magnus. The Kagan would never be bribed nor intimidated. He wanted for nothing he did not already have, and was willful in his dedication to walking his own path. Simply put, Jagatai would never be ordered, nor even led. Entreaties and demands would be rebuked. If the Kagan would walk his own path, then any who sought to use him must lay that path before him, and disguise it in such a way as to make its artificiality completely invisible. In the words of one chronicler, Horus would have to be extremely careful lest the horse he wished to tame bolt. While an equine analogy when discussing the White Scars is gauche, it is nevertheless apt. Horus would need to create and control every possible factor if he wished to change the mind of his brother, not to mention closing off paths that would otherwise be open to him. The White Scars must be removed from the company of others, detached from their contemporaries even further than their already famous isolationism. Any information the Legion received must only come from Horus and sources he controlled. Finally, they must be occupied, and must do so in a conflict that would satisfy not only the role they played within the Great Crusade, but also their own personal desires. Thus, the Fifth Legion was dispatched to Chandax, in numbers that approached their totality. The region was but a few warp jumps from Yulinor itself, yet so far from the most well-traveled of warp corridors as to be, essentially, a backwater. It was a place of little strategic importance, and far from anything that approximated a major population center or military hub. In short, it suited the Scars perfectly, as they could now occupy themselves with the prosecution of the remaining remnants of the Orcoid Empire the Imperium had only just shattered. The Xenos strain is especially pernicious, able to renew itself with comparative scraps in comparatively hostile systems, rendering their total purgation a matter of quite some importance. To the Khan, Horus presented the deployment in an atavistic fashion. The Chandax campaign would be a return to the halcyon days of the early Great Crusade, free from the mewling of remembrancers or the whining of Terran bureaucrats. Instead of Imperial oversight, the White Scars would be loosed upon a vast star system on a grand hunt, to roam and kill to the sound of their own laughter. Horus knew the Kagan and his sons, and knew that they were disquieted by the shift in tone of the Great Crusade as of late. The propaganda efforts of the Remembrancers, the increasing demands of administratum assayers, and the withdrawal of the Emperor from the front lines. The Imperium was changing, visibly, and the Fifth Legion, ever sidelined and unremarked upon, were unsure of their future within it. Horus promised them a return to a frontier, to a vast horizon before them, with no one snapping at their heels. Honor there was in this endeavor to place the final line upon the gravestone of Urlak Urg. Moreover, the War Master presented Chandax to the Khan not as an order, but as a favor asked of a friend. Ever the consummate manipulator, Horus appealed to the Brotherhood as opposed to the pulling of ranks. This may have been a simple maneuver, but its impact cannot be understated. Asking for help was an act of humility that spoke deeply to the Kagan, and he and his white scars answered modesty with generosity. They would make for the new frontier with all haste. Yet as history has shown, and as the unbalanced scales attest, the Kagan was not the only brother to whom Horus turned. Alpharius, Primarch of the 20th Legion, was similarly instructed to deploy to Chandax, under extremely specific sets of orders. These instructions, and their timing, are a potent factor in scholarly debate about the precise timing of Horus's fall to the basest of treacheries. The White Scars and the Alpha Legion, albeit the latter clandestinely, were ordered to Chandax somewhere around 000 to 001 M31, some three to four standard years before the War Master fell to the corrupted blade of Yugen Temba on the moon of Davin, the commonly held catalyst for his corruption 
and fall from grace. The orders given to the Alpha Legion at Ulanor speak quite clearly to a plan designed to trap the White Scars in place. It is possible that Horus, nurturing seeds of discontent within his heart, merely wished to isolate his willful brother Jagatai for such a time as he could entrench his position as War Master and test the boundaries of his now personal power. This hypothesis is lent credence by the isolating of his main rivals, Gilliman, Sanguinius, and the Lion. As with other absolutist leaders throughout history, Horus could merely have been courting an inner circle, and politically maneuvering possible opponents for means if not benign, then perhaps not explicitly murderous. Of course, the Razor of Occam states that one must simply take the most reasonable explanation. That Horus's rebellion existed as a possibility even as the brightest son of the Imperium was invested with an office like none other and that the only question that should matter is when the greater intelligences of primordial annihilation sunk their chaotic tendrils into his heart. The other question that persists within historiography here is why Alpharius, Primarch of the Alpha Legion, would so readily accede to the War Master's orders for his legion at this time. Given the timing, it seems doubtful that the Ulanor Triumph was the first introduction to Horus's plans that the Alpha Legion were given. Their turning to his cause must have happened earlier, although the reasons for their doing so are debatable. Unlike, for example, Mortarion, whose open disdain for imperial policies was well known, or Angron, whose hatred for his genetic lineage was similarly notorious, or even Fulgrim, whose personality and closeness to the War Master made him an ideal target for manipulation, Alpharius had no explicit motivations for taking any sort of stand against the Imperium or the Emperor. Indeed, there is essentially nothing explicit about the mysterious Primarch. His relationships to his brothers were few, and most of those on record are known to be contentious, but intellectually so. The 20th Primarch disagreed fundamentally on tactical principles with both 13th Primarch Gilliman and 7th Primarch Rogel Dorn, but unlike the latter's confrontation with Conrad Kurz, this never came to violence. There are threads of evidence in the most classified of sources, and curiously within the unbalanced scales, of an outside influence that swayed the mind of Alpharius Omegon. Scholars of note, none of which have survived, point to an incident during the Alpha Legion's prosecution of the Nerthene War, where the 20th were supposedly contacted by a cabal of Xenos agents who shared warp-scried foresight with the inscrutable Primarch. According to the Xenos, the Scales records, the rebellion of Horus was imminent and must be allowed to happen, should humanity and the galaxy as a whole have any hope of survival. Certainly, the Alpha Legion's utilitarian practicality was legendary, as was their willingness to utterly subsume their individual needs to those of the Collective. Had Alpharius Omegon decided that survival of the galaxy was worth a civil war that would tear the very realm he was helping build apart? Yeah, we will never know. Other, less circumspect scholarship simply declares the 20th Primarch as a willful agent of anarchy, stating that Alpharius wished to see just everything burn, for the fun of it. Your humblest servant has long since given up hope of discerning motive where that Primarch is concerned. You may debate amongst yourselves what you choose to believe. One has engaged in speculation, but if there is one fact the Chondact campaign illustrates, from the beginning is that the Horus heresy was an event that went far beyond a son's misplaced ambition. While it may have ended with a father and a bloody rock, the conflict drew the attentions and machinations of outer forces, malign and secretive. The greater intelligence of the warp, the Xenos Cabal, the Cognite, those who exist perpetually, the hidden hands of many sought to guide, usurp, or even exploit the future of mankind, and the work of several parties is clearly evident at Chondax. 
Seeds of treachery were sown here years before the War Master bade the galaxy burn, and even years before the first wolf slew the first son of the Crimson King. The Alpha Legion, willing compatriots in the schemes of Horus, were ordered to Chondax with all possible haste to lay the foundations for the arrival of the White Scars. Their aim would not be to engage the Fifth Legion in combat, quite the opposite. The Alpha Legion were a subtle tool, and Horus was by this point quite accustomed to utilizing their talents. The Twentieth would turn Chondax into a labyrinthine trap, a sandbox of misdirection and quietude, into which the Kagan would lead his Astartes unknowingly and blindly. Isolated there, chasing orcs to the ends of the vast trinary system, the White Scars would be unable to interdict in anything the War Master chose to enact. The burning of Prospero, for example, would be denied to them. Magnus and the Khan were close allies, outsiders in their brotherhood, concerned deeply with matters both intellectual and spiritual. Often they were at odds ideologically, but both possessed an unwavering respect for the other's point of view. Had the Kagan been given word of the fate of Magnus, of his actions against the writ of the Emperor, even his censure, there would not be a law nor plea in the galaxy that would have stopped him from rushing to the aid of the Crimson King. This seemingly was the hand of Horus. Isolation, fragmentation, deprivation. When he would decide it, the wolves and the thousand suns would bloody each other in splendid, horrible sequestration. For the Kagan, Horus likely aimed to provide him with drip-fed truth, subtle lies, just enough to sway his brother from the fealty to a distant, uncaring king, and to the side of the War Master in brotherly comradeship. But, as we will see, such apparently simple matters were far from that. Ave Imperator, Gloria in Excelsis Terra. This video and this channel were made possible thanks to the very kind donations and support from my Patreon subscribers. If you'd like to help support the channel, head on over to patreon.com slash oculusimperia. If you'd like to receive more updates about the channel and any future videos, you can contact me or follow me on Twitter at Oculus Imperia. Otherwise, please like, subscribe, comment, let me know your feedback, and as ever, thank you very much for watching.